Hello and welcome to the first video in a series of videos about uh, the USB Mega Drive dev kit. Um, so the Sega Mega Drive was a game console from the early 1990s uh, and the idea was that you bought cartridges like this, um, plastic things, and you stuck them in the top and turn the machine on and the game, the game that you plugged in would, would just start running. Um, so if you wanted to play a different game, you'd have to take this out and put another one in, and then turn it on and on again. Uh, so it was a little bit, a little bit crap like that. Um, and I guess I, <laughs> I talk about this being crap like uh, like I'm speaking from experience, but actually I've I've probably spent a total of about an hour in my entire life playing Mega Drive games. So I didn't have one when I was a kid. Uh, there's no particular nostalgia for me in it, but it's just quite an interesting platform. And I'll talk a bit later about my own personal motivations for, for getting involved in, in this thing. Um, but for now, let's have a look inside one of these cartridges and, and see, what's, uh, see what's what. OK, so uh, there are a couple of little uh, screws here holding the cartridge together, so I'll remove those to start with. And then you see that inside is this little double-sided printed circuit board um, with the Mega Drive Edge connector here and uh, a mask programmed read-only memory here. Um, so what makes the Mega Drive interesting, I guess, is is that it's it's complex enough to be interesting, but it's simple enough to be understandable. Um, at, its, at its heart is uh, the 68,000 microprocessor, like this one. Um, and um, I guess the, the 68000 was arguably the first attempt to cram into a single chip the kind of programming model that at the time, in the late 70s, was limited to very big and very expensive computers. Um, but even so, the actual computers that were built from the 68000 throughout the 1980s um, were actually quite complex. Um, there were a few Unix workstations, uh, the Commodore Amiga, the Atari ST and the first Macs were 68000 based. Um, but the Mega Drive is the exact opposite, so rather than having an operating system that loads software from disk into RAM, um, Mega Drive software lives entirely on these ROM chips, um, which just get mapped into the 68000's address space on power-up, um, so they run directly on the bare metal of the machine um, without any operating system whatsoever. Uh, so that makes it an excellent platform for learning about how computers work under the covers. So, my idea was to design a completely open source custom cartridge um, which would map modern SDRAM um, into the address space of the 68000 and allow code to be loaded both over USB and via an SD card. Um, so, I mean, SD cards, here's a, here's a 2 gig SD card. Um, and to, give it, to put things in, into perspective, um, in the entire history of the Mega Drive, maybe 900 games were written. Um, most of them were about 1 or 2 megabytes in size. So. Um, every single game that was ever written would fit on this one little card, and this thing isn't even particularly uh, small uh, by today's standards. So, in parallel with this line of thinking, I, I was busy teaching myself about FPGAs and digital electronics in general, um, so I built an open source software toolkit and library called FPGA Link, which I guess you can think of as, a, as kind of a hardware abstraction layer for allowing many different sorts of computers to talk to many different sorts of FP FPGAs. Um, using standard interfaces, so you know you can buy FPGA boards like these. Um, let's move this stuff over. Um, so here's here's a here's an FPGA board um, that uses a Xilinx FPGA, and uh, here's another board that uh, that uses a Xilinx FPGA. Um, there's there's one that uses a Lattice FPGA and. Finally, there's one that uses an Altera um, FPGA. Um, so the idea is that you can build applications that run on Mac OS X, Linux, and Windows, and that communicate with all these different sorts of FPGA boards and more. I mean, this is just a small selection. Um, and when you've done, when you've got things working with a commercial um, FPGA dev kit like one of these, you can design your own PCB and then run FPGA Link on that too. And in fact, several uh, individual companies and universities have gone ahead and done that, designed their own FPGA Link compatible custom PCBs. So I thought I'd have a go myself, and here's the result. Um, so this is an open source hardware board, it's got the little open source hardware logo. Um, 
And I guess you, you, you can think of this as like the, uh, an FPGA link reference design. Um, so it's a four layer PCB um, and it has an FPGA here. It has a 16 megabyte uh, SD RAM here. It has a fast USB interface here. It has uh, 512K uh, kilobytes of flash, um, flash um, memory here. Um, it's got an SD card slot on the back. And it's got along this edge connector 56, sorry, 46 general purpose FPGA IOs. Um, and on this edge connector here, it's got eight general purpose USB accessible IOs. Um, so I wanted to make it as cheap as possible and e as easy to build as possible. So uh, the PCB is about $4 each, um, the FPGA is about $10. Uh, the USB interface is about four dollars. The SD RAM is about two dollars, and so on. So all in all, in all, the board, the, the whole board weighs in at about thirty or forty US dollars. Um, and with a bit of skill and patience and a decent soldering iron, you should uh, you should be able to make one up at home without too much difficulty. Uh, so I guess one problem with interfacing. Um, stuff like this with retro hardware is that everything here uses 3.3 volt signaling um, whereas for example the Mega Drive uses 5 volt signaling so even if this was mechanically compatible with the Mega Drive slot if I plugged it in it would get fried pretty quickly um, so to uh, to fix that I designed this second PCB which is like a little bridge board this too is open source hardware as you can see the little logo there um, so this is a bridge board. It basically it's it's just two layers this time. It's not 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 four, and uh, it has the edge connector here, which is uh, which is for plugging into the the Mega Drive, um, and it uh, that actually matches up the um, the edge connector of the commercial the commercial gain quite nicely, um, and on the other side it has this this edge connector here, which we sh we can um, we can connect together to the FPGA board and the result is quite mechanically um, quite mechanically sound um, okay so um, I uh, then cut a slot in the top of this cartridge this plastic here uh, and um, so there's, there's just a thin slot here that I've cut using a file and so this thing actually has um, little holes in exactly the same places that the uh, that the commercial that the commercial games do here and here, um, and they fit quite nicely into the uh, into the PCB. It helps if I get it the right way around, though. Uh, okay, so that sits quite quite nicely, and then I can put in the top and screw it back together. I'll just put one screw in. Okay, so um, so basically, the, the idea is that the the FPGA boots from the bottom um, the bottom three quarters, basically the bottom seventy five percent of of this flash chip here, um, and uh, and then that leaves the top quarter free, the top twenty five percent free, which is basically one hundred twenty eight kilobytes. So in that one hundred twenty eight kilobytes, um, I have installed a couple of things. Firstly, a, a menu program that um, that will present a menu of the games stored on the uh, on the SD card. Let's put the SD card in, um, and uh, secondly, uh, um, a machine code monitor program that allows uh, a GDB debugger, a GNU debugger, um, to connect to the Mega Drive over USB. Uh, so the USB connection is, is pretty fast. Um, it uh, it's capable of, of reading and writing a continuous stream of data um, to to or from disk at, at over 40, 40 megabytes per second, um, and the SD RAM itself is fast enough to um, to manage to interleave reads and writes by the Mega Drive with uh, reads and writes over USB. Uh, so it's a, effectively a dual port a dual port RAM. Uh, so it's actually quite quite straightforward to set up, like an arbitrary um, remote remote procedure call arrangement um, using uh, shared me this, the the, the SD, SD RAM as shared memory uh, and just one of the locations in SD RAM as, as like a semaphore. Um, so that means that you can load code quickly and the debug uh, debug connection is pretty responsive uh, when single stepping and so on. Um, but it um, 
It also means that you can set up a real-time instruction trace, uh, a bit like S-Trace on Unix, um, where the details of every single 68,000 bus cycle is saved to disk, um, along with a 20 nanosecond resolution timestamp. Um, so the trace log is uh, limited only by disk space, basically. So if you've got a typical like two terabyte drive, you can trace continuously for over 24 hours before filling it up. Um, so anyway, enough talk about this. Uh, let's uh, let me show you how this thing works. So um, if you plug in the UMDK cart and uh, power power up the machine. It uh, boots into this menu program, um, and I can scroll up and down using the uh, using the control pad um, and select a game. Let's let's play Sonic One. Um, so Sonic One is only 512k of uh, of ROM space, so it loads it loads pretty quickly off the SD card. Um, so I can play it and um, have fun with Sonic One for a bit, and eventually. Of course, you'll get bored of it, so you just turn it off and then turn it on again, and then you can choose a different game. Let's choose Super Street Fighter 2, the new challenges. So this game was the largest game ever written uh, for the Mega Drive. It's five megabyte cartridge, um, and they had to put all sorts of crazy uh, bank switching stuff, which I've had to emulate in the, in the uh, UMDK cart, um, basically to fit the 512, uh, sorry, the, the five uh, meg of um, of ROM space into the available 4 meg um, slot in the 68000's address space. Uh, okay, so that's the end of this introduction. In, in the next video I'll connect up the, uh, the, the UMDK uh, cart via the USB cable to a PC and show you how the debugger connection works. In the meantime, thanks for listening.